Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show. Today, as you can see, we're joining you via our library and we're going to be having our guests join via Zoom. And it's an evolving technology, and we think we've got it mostly mastered, but uh, there's some connection is issues, and so if we fade in or out, just bear with us. The content is outstanding and, and worth any technical difficulties we may have. Uh, today we want to talk, about, talk with Rosemary Gibson and Frank Gaffney, and Rosemary is the author of China Rx, which is exposing the risks of America's dependence on China for medicine and many other books on that put a human face in our health care issues. Uh, she's a senior advisor at the Hastings Center, and at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, she's successfully established palliative care in more than 1,600 hospitals in the United States. She has a Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. Rosemary, welcome. Thank you, Bill. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm thrilled you're here. Also joining me is my frequent uh, collaborator and, and good friend, Frank Gaffney. Uh, Frank is the founder of the Center for Security Policy and vice chairman of the Committee for the Present Danger China. Uh, to kick shows, the kick today shows off. I want to talk about uh, where we are with our supply chain issues. We're dealing with a, a global pandemic, and we're concerned about healthcare equipment, supplies, drugs, that sort of thing. But this has been a problem in the works for years. And Clyde Prestowitz, who was one of our trade representatives during uh, the Clinton era, has written recently, I think yesterday, uh, he says, in addition to making the world sick, the, pro the coronavirus pandemic has dramatically illustrated the high cost of global supply chain. For 40 years, economists have promoted globalization based on supply chains that rely heavily on cheap non-union Chinese labor uh, to assemble parts of around the world that are made into final products and then reshape largely to consumers in rich countries. This was said to be an ideal division of labor that optimized returns to all participants. Well, we need to dig into this because that certainly has not turned out to be the case, and we're reaping, uh, reaping the uh, rewards, or if so-called, of that strategy. Diana, would you talk a bit, start kick it off a bit about uh, our medical health care supply chain issues and uh, where we stand? Diana, uh, Rosemary. Sorry. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Bill. Uh, you mentioned the the quote from what would on back in the early 1980s when we opened up free trade with China. It's quite remarkable that when I was writing the China RX book, I was sitting in the same room uh, where I am now and I put the pieces together that within a couple of years, two years of opening up free trade with China, that's when we lost our last aspirin plant. We cannot make aspirin in the United States because China's companies formed a cartel dumped it on the global market and drove out all the producers. So we can't make the core chemicals in our aspirin. It's when we last, lost our last penicillin plant. And it's the same playbook. This isn't just because China's cheaper. It's not because of weaker regulations, but there's a cartel formation that is illegal under US law, but no one ever took Chinese companies to task for violating U.S. antitrust law. So, so when did this begin? It began in, in 1984. The U.S. Congress and the White House agreed on, let's have generic drugs. And generic drugs are now 90% of the medicines that we all take. And it was considered a boon back then because they would be cheaper. These would be products that were branded products and their patents had run out. And why don't we make them available to people at lower cost? And all of us, I'm sure, have benefited, or we know people who've benefited to having access to cheaper drugs. But well, we, now almost 90% yeah. of our drugs are generic. That's right. And where I've come out is thousands and thousands 
of the core chemicals and ingredients to make them, Bill, we depend on China. And the pandemic, how you open this story up, here we are in the middle of a global pandemic. And let's take the medicines that would be needed right today in hospitals for people being treated with severe cases. So people will need sedatives if they have to be on a ventilator. They might need antibiotics if they get a bacterial infection. They might need these epinephrine or dopamine to raise their blood pressure if they're, if they're collapsing. To make those, these are the bread and butter medicines in our medicine cabinets and hospitals. These aren't the shiny, you know, the brand new drugs. These are the basic bread and butter ones that have been around for years. To make them, China controls 90% of the core chemicals. So here we have a situation where we have a global pandemic and the whole world depends on a single country for those core chemicals to make critical drugs. And this was regrettably predicted in China RX when it came out in 2018. Yeah, China RX, you wrote two years ago, was an incredible story. I recommend everybody to buy it, read it, study it, and talk to your elected officials about doing something about it. Frank, the Chinese have been at this for a while, not just with medicine, but with other uh, uh, strategic uh, uh, supplies, goods. What, what's your sense of how this got started? With, was it the free trade agreement that basically uh, changed the um, arrangements? Well, I'd go back to uh, the early 1990s uh, when then General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, Deng Xiaoping, um, observed that the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union was over and that the Soviets, of course, had lost. And then he said, and this was to you know, trusted party cadre colleagues, there is a new, now going to be a new Cold War between the United States and China, and China will win this one. And I think from that moment forward with the uh, enunciation of what came to be known as his hide and bide strategy for achieving the kind of integration that Rosemary's just talked about, the, the kind of um, dominance economically in so many production uh, areas. Uh, this one is particularly resonant because especially in the midst of a pandemic crisis, um, suddenly warnings that Rosemary was sounding to a great credit two years ago are very much top of mind for all of us. The other piece of this, though, Bill, that I think is, is operating is this is personal to virtually all of us. This is not something that is an abstraction like any of the other things that you mentioned we could talk about, uh, flat screens, uh, rare earth minerals, um, you know, steel, uh, you name it. There are industries that have electronics, chips, and so on that have been taken down by exactly the same predatory trade practices that Rosemary has documented in China RX in this particular microcosmic example. And it's part of that strategy, uh, hiding the true intentions of the Chinese over all these years, biding their time, but inexorably strangling the industrial capabilities of the United States. And Rosemary says the free market itself that's what's going on here. And uh, I think this is uh, the moment when it must not be allowed to persist, either with respect to medicines or any of these other critical national security as well as economic security interests. Well, from America's standpoint, I think we did this largely with good intentions. The idea was that we would bring China into the free trade system and they would trade with us. They'd become wealthier as they became wealthier. They'd become more democratic and integrate into the uh, into the, into the world economic, political, social order, that hasn't happened. What we didn't reckon with was how powerful the Chinese Communist Party is in China. And, and in many ways, we're not talking about the Chinese, we're talking about the Chinese Communist Party and its strategy. Uh, what we also didn't reckon on is that they had no interest in actually just being another nation in the great you know, uh, international community. They wanted to be, they've set their sights on becoming 
and they are well on their way towards actually achieving their goal of world domination. Well, uh, Rosemary, I'm, I was reading your book, getting increasingly disturbed, and then I came upon a drug that uh, I now take, which is called, uh, am, I can't pronounce it, amylopapine vesylate or something like that, and it, it's a generic, and, but then you point out 89% of our prescription filled in the United States are generic. That's right, and China already has 10% market share. They make 10% of our generic drugs right now. And that happened in just a very short period of time. The first generic approved from China was in 2007. And they are ramping up very quickly now. And meanwhile, here in the US, our generic manufacturing base is almost collapsed. And meanwhile, our taxpayer dollars, the money we pay when we buy our prescription drugs, $6 billion a year is going to build up China's industry as our industry here is falling apart. You know, back to the geopolitical perspective here, Bill, if you think about it, if you control medicines, and among those you control antibiotics, you control the world. We're concerned about a, a virus that's infectious, but bear in mind if there were a bacterial infection, we can't make antibiotics here in the United States anymore. Well, isn't one of the big issues that we don't know where it's, it, it, it's not it's not just China, but it's the manufacturing plants in China. And if there are, drugs are manufactured here in the United States, we have FDA inspectors that go in and make sure the facility is is uh, is what we want it to be. Yet we've got no ability to uh, inspect the facilities in China, and the Chinese uh, Communist Party sort of uh, routinely doesn't let us do that. Well, right now, there are no FDA inspectors in China because as federal employees, they were pulled back, which is the wise thing to do, given uh, we want to protect their health and safety. But China has made it very difficult for the federal government to ensure the safety of products made in China. Think about this. You are a federal employee, and you have a lot of great technical knowledge on how to make medicines. And you go into a plant there, and you write up a report that says, here are all these deficiencies. You're the person that's stopping potentially a very large Chinese company from sending product to the United States. Do you think the Chinese government would ever want to give you a visa again to come back. And what I'm very concerned about, Bill, is that where are we headed? I think we're coming to the point very quickly where China's going to say to the U.S. government, we don't need you anymore. We don't want you anymore to come in and inspect, let alone our food that comes from China, but our medicines. Because we'll do it ourselves. We have our own China FDA and the US taxpayers have helped grow the sophistication of the China FDA, but it has a long way to go. You know, two years ago, there was a blood pressure medicine that was sold to millions of Americans and people around the world. It had carcinogens in it. And the Chinese product had more than 200 times the acceptable limit per pill. And so China's view is, and I write about this in China RX, that the attitude is. One of the reasons our products are so cheap is because we assume no liability for them. And once you become dependent on a single country, it's take it or leave it because you have no choice. And we've done that. We have already started to do this bill that we have our, in the United States of America, our federal agency is in the position of having to balance out having some supply versus having some substandard products on the market. There was a plant in, one plant in China to show how concentrated we are. We wouldn't do this for oil. We wouldn't have 80% or 90% of the world's oil supply in a single country and the refining capacity. There was one plant in China that blew up and there was a global shortage of a very important antibiotic to treat sepsis. And the regulators in Europe said, you know, we're going to allow this to come into Europe, and the FDA did too, but the Europeans said it doesn't meet standard, but because we have no choice. 
So globalization has been a form of de facto deregulation and a diminution in the standards that of Americans have come to expect after all these generations of building up the gold standard. It's yeah. just being totally watered down. And in this case, Bill, obviously you're talking about life and death when those standards are lowered, it can be fatal. And Rosemary's chronicled some examples where that's actually happened to Americans. But could I just come back to something she touched on a moment ago, particularly given your background in finance? We have been enabling this. Uh, not just our companies that have been looking for the, you know, the lowest labor costs that can allow them to eke out some marginal advantage, some profit. I'm talking about Wall Street. Uh, you mentioned $6 billion, Rosemary. Uh, that's obviously a, a huge number, but it's a tiny fraction oh, sure. of what American capitalists have been sending in the way of stocks and bonds investments to China. By some estimates, it's $3 trillion all in. And they're coming back, we're told, for 3 to $5 trillion more. If that money isn't made available to the Chinese Communist Party, and that's effectively who we're subsidizing here, we're going to be able to deny them the money to do some of the things that Rosemary's chronicled, as I said, but also a whole host of other things uh, that involve, among other than uh, building weapon systems with which to kill us. This is truly insane. Well, we did have something back in the 80s or 90s or called the China Lobby. And as you recollect, we had Henry Kissinger and Alexander Haig and, and uh, Cyrus Vance. They were in the lead of that. Goldman Sachs was a major player. So was, well, st they maybe still are. Uh, but so the, so the unintended consequences are, or maybe intended, I don't know what, how to call it, are that you passed something called the U.S.-China Trade Relations Act of 2000. And we signed that in law because we felt like that was going to bring China into the world order. We also thought letting um, low value manufacturing go to China uh, would lower costs for American consumers. And initially that was the effect. And yet the first year, was it three years after the uh, law was signed, we ended up with a trade deficit of $114 billion. I'm, uh, I'm quoting uh, Rosemary on that. Uh, but it, uh, and so we've been living with that deficit ever since. And now, uh, you know, where, uh, so we've got, but the, but the thing that I'm interested in when I read your book, Rosemary, is that it's not just low value manufacturing jobs that got outsourced, but when you came around to the pharmaceutical industries, the big pharmaceutical companies have been sending their research and development labs to uh, China. And I think Merck is now, was it a year and a half ago, three, two years ago, they opened a billion five research facility in Beijing. Thoughts? <laughs> You're right. We've, China is ramping up quickly from making the, the chemicals to the finished drugs to doing the R&D and to their credit, uh, they want to have medicine for their one point something billion people. But our U.S.-based headquarter companies are investing billions of dollars in research capability in China, as we are have lost tens and thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of STEM jobs, of jobs that are the future of our country. And this is part of China's plan to address and go after and take over disrupt, dominate, and displace 20 different sectors of our economy that are the future. Without that, we have no economy. We'll be flipping That's burgers and maybe having tourists and doing, you know, healthcare, home, home care aides and doctors and nurses. Mm -hmm. We'll have nothing left. So you're right. And those finished drugs, you can bet those R&D for those drugs, they're going to be made in China and then sent back here. If they choose to, uh, and, and Rosemary point, pointed out that uh, maybe they won't. Uh, in fact, we've seen in this present crisis that they haven't been so much. And that's aside from the problem of adulteration of the drugs, making them actually toxic in some cases. What, what if they just cut us off because they say they don't need us anymore or they don't have enough for their own people? That's a distinct possibility. And I, I just want to say again, Bill, 
hats off to Rosemary for having warned about this two years ago. And she was picking up on, you know, inaction by successive administrations. So it's not uh, uniquely the fault of the present one. In fact, I think the present one is doing more than anybody else, particularly in this crisis, to try to remedy it. But it's part of an overall uh, failure of understanding the true nature of the Chinese Communist Party, its actual ambitions, and their implications for the rest of us. And I'm sure you may have seen the the statement from the Chinese uh, government media actually threatening to withhold drugs mm -hmm. and to throw the United States into the ocean of or hell of coronavirus. Yeah. And there were threats before, but this is the most brazen. So you, te you testified in, in front of Congress in July of 2019. So what is that, 10 months ago? What happened after that? Was there any action among, uh, among either the Senate or the House based on uh, what they learned uh, from you and the other, the other testimony? Yeah, that, that was testimony before the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission that was um, combined with a representative from the Department of Defense and others, and it was very, very powerful. And frankly, just one other point on the quality issue, one of the retired military people who's a commissioner on the US-China Commission spoke up and said, and I have the 90 second clip, I wish you could show it. He said, I got three different blood pressure medicines and they were contaminated with rocket fuel ingredients made in China. He said, if I'm getting that, then active duty military must also be getting it. Well, so, uh, send, so us the the, send us the clip and we'll make sure it, uh, if you've got, you have access to it, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll uh, fit it in. That's great. So, so this raises the point that it's a national security problem. Absolutely. Not just a public health one. And so then that migrated to a uh, testimony before the House Energy and Commerce Health Subcommittee where there was you know, dramatic interest in Made in America and then most recently with the Senate Small Business Committee chaired by Senator Rubio. Now, small businesses here in the United States, unlike the multinationals, are ready to go and they want to make product, the critical drugs that we need here in the United States. They want to use innovative technology. These are the new innovators. And we've got to allow them room in this marketplace to be able to uh, make it and to sell their product. And, you know, if we brought menu, we could actually, we're getting into solutions here, but just a preview, we can actually make medicine, generic drugs here in the United States faster, cheaper, with a much smaller environmental footprint and real-time quality control. Yeah, real-time quality control is the key point. So it has percolated up and I've been impressed with how much talk now there is about our dependence on China for medicine. If nothing else, China RX has started that. And now we have to get to solutions, which again, we could have a whole nother show on that. Well, let's let's have another show on detailed solutions, but let's let's sort of frame that because this pandemic, this virus has been horrific, but there are silver linings to this. And what it's done is exposed our tremendous vulnerability to, uh, to China and not just with medical supplies, but with everything else. And how they behaved, how, you mentioned something, they said they're threatening to cut people off. Was that a random government uh, country's office? Was that a random government official, or is that something that's looming and something the Chinese are thinking is a strategic uh, uh, piece of aggression? Oh, I think it was a very strategic, strategic and very clear statement in the state news agency. So mm -hmm. this is not random. It's not a professor at a, at a university. Everything is said with a purpose. And uh, I hope that is a wake up call. I hope it is a silver lining. And, you know, this issue, there's so many good people who have been working on the challenges of our dependence on China for so many things. This topic of medicine, which everybody can identify with, as Frank said earlier, it's personal. You give it to your kids. You rely on it when you go into a hospital. And I've had doctors tell me that they are losing trust in generic, the generic drugs, some of them that they're giving to their patients, because I don't want to scare people, but some of them say, I see these medicines, and they don't seem to be working as they should. Mm -hmm. So this is this is a, um, a gateway for the public to understand what's really going on with China, and the fact that you want to withhold it, 
withhold medicines from people and send them contaminated product. The narrative is there. So I hope it is a way and a means of waking up our country to have solutions and not go back to the way, you know, six months from now we were well, doing things. Well, my understanding is that the White House does this, have, have this on the radar screen for when things calm down that we can start uh, putting a new, new regime in place. Frank, have you heard anything? I've heard that too. Uh, my only concern is, Bill, um, who knows when things are going to start calming down. And True. I think Peter Navarro, for example, uh, with whom Rosemary has worked, um, is clear eyed about this. Uh, he's talking about it. I think he's helping prepare this executive order that is uh, clearly uh, something needed right now. Uh, and I believe he understands that uh, whatever we wind up doing after things calm down, as they say, um, we had best be getting our ducks in the line right now to try to diversify our sources of supply, to assure that we have quality control in place, and to minimize, um, both in this particular space, but also more generally, our dependence upon communist China for anything that matters to us. Mm -hmm. Well, well well, I want to call an audible and say, let's let's talk right now about what we ought to be doing, because I think we've given ourselves a sense that we've got a big problem. Rosemary, what do you recommend? What are, what are three or four things that we ought to be thinking about putting in place right this uh, moment? Bill, one of the recommendations I made last summer to the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission, just to get things going, is to have where Congress has authority, uh, have the Department of Defense, the VA, and the Health and Human Services Department. You know, we have an $8 billion strategic national stockpile that includes critical drugs. That we use the procurement dollars now that we spend to buy medicines made here in the United States, at least to start it for critical drugs. You know, people say, oh, there's a list of 20 critical drugs. Everybody wants to know what they are. I have an idea of what they are. I don't have the official list, but it's pretty obvious. This is bread and butter stuff you need to run your healthcare system. And so enable the DOD to cut through the red tape to allow the federal agencies to buy medicines and to support products made in the United States. That would be a huge step forward. You've got 10 million people covered by the Department of Defense, another 10 million in the VA, 20 million people. Just get those contracts going. It's one thing to have manufacturing here, but you need people to buy them. Well, it seems to me that, as you point out in your book, that disclosure would be an incredibly powerful tool because right now, if you look at your label of pills, your bottle of pills, and you look at the label, you can't see where it's manufactured. You can see maybe who distributes it, but you don't know its country of origin. And particularly if it's a sub-ingredient that comes from China, you're not going to see that in the label ever. Yet, as you point out, something like 95% of Americans do not trust drugs that are manufactured in China. So simple disclosure on the bottles, I think, would create cons an incredible consumer demand to say, look, we want, we want you to pull that manufacturing back here and, and bring those jobs back to Connecticut and Illinois and you know, all the places where they've been lost. Thoughts? Well, it's timely you say that because uh, special interests got together and there was a federal uh, circuit court case in D.C. that determined it was around the VA. The VA has a provision under the Trade Agreements Act that they could only buy in, from certain designated countries. And that pertained to the core, what they call active ingredient. That's what makes a medicine medicine. And under that Trade Agreements Act, uh, the federal government would have to buy only from designated countries. It could not buy from China. But we need if to the get the pharmaceutical. If, the, if, if we... the API was made there. And guess what that court decision just did? It reversed that. It said if the API is made in China, but if the drug is finished, you know, turned into a pill or a vial here in the United States, it can still be labeled as made in the United States. We'll see, that's it's just absolutely scandalous. That's got to change. So I think they knew what was coming. And so it's, again, hiding. And so it enables uh, the VA, requires the VA, 
in February 2020 to become even more dependent on China. In fact, what's really remarkable, uh, Bill, is, and Frank, there was a, you know, uh, Dr. Navarro has been talking about an executive order to have the DOD, VA, and HHS buy critical drugs made in the United States, at least to get that manufacturing capability going. It's quite remarkable. Someone sent me, and I saw it in the media, uh, a draft letter to the White House opposing Buy American for the military and the VA, saying it would destabilize the medicine supply chain. Now, this this is, is, if I could just add. And this is just two weeks after. So we have special interests that want the United States to become even more dependent on a country that has threatened to kill us by withholding medicines. Are these the pharmaceutical companies? Is this I'll the drug lobby? I'll just say they're special interests, and there's a lot of them. Yeah, I'll, I'll say that there's a pharmaceutical companies that have benefited from this arrangement. Um, Rosemary's more uh, diplomatic about it for her own reasons. But l let me just tell you, Bill, I think that what we're watching here is symptomatic of, well, divided loyalties is how I would put it. Uh, they're, they're more loyal to the profit opportunities than they are to the American people. And we've just seen how President Trump has, I think, quite properly treated 3M over this uh, decision that it was going to sell masks that uh, Americans need to uh, the Chinese or, or others overseas. And uh, he didn't take it well. As he said, he was, he was going to get even uglier over this kind of thing. And I, I think everyone should be on notice that this is a matter of national security as well as public health. And if we treat it that way, um, business as usual arrangements that have gotten us in this fix, as, as Rosemary has done such a brilliant job documenting, are not tolerable any longer. It must be ended. Well, for a long time, and I've done, I'm not going to go to the mattress defending drug companies, but for a long time, everybody thought, well, let's, let's make this stuff where it's cheapest, it's good for the consumer, brings China in, and that's a win-win for everybody. But particularly when, when, when President Trump came in and started challenging China, exposing all these, I think one of the big things he exposed is just the overall strategic intentions that China has. And so we've been negotiating this these economic arrangements uh, as if we're just all free traders, and uh, they're not, they never were, and never will be. But they are perfectly capable of taking advantage of that asymmetry. And I, I think they must be pinching themselves that they've gotten away with it for as long as they have. And if there's any silver lining, and it's hard to say there can be in, in a pandemic where you know, tens of thousands of Americans are losing their lives and many more may yet. But if there is any upside to what's happened here, it is that Rosemary Gibson is being given the kind of hearing she should have gotten two years ago. And more to the point, uh, President Trump himself and those of us who've been arguing for a decoupling from the kind of business as usual arrangements that you described that at a point may have been perfectly reasonable or innocuous, not anymore. It's not tolerable anymore. Rosemary? Well, when I'm out talking with people of all political stripes on social media, the public's outraged. You can't tell the difference between people who are Democrats or Republicans in the audience. Right because everybody takes a pill or they give something to their child or grandchild or grandparent. And it's a, it's a matter of trust. Right. So, what, you know, what's interesting, what I, Bill, if I could just on that point, we, as you know, as a member of the committee on the present danger of China, as, as Rosemary Gibson is, uh, we did a poll, a national poll before this pandemic really set in, which bears out exactly what Rosemary just said, even then, not just at the top line level, but the, the demographic subgroups of that poll of 1,000 likely voters in the 2020 election, overwhelmingly and uniformly, were deeply concerned about China and very uneasy uh, about the idea that anybody 
would be recommending more of the business as usual that's gotten us in our present parlous fix with them. Bill, as your, uh, your viewers may want to know updates on this and to, to create more momentum and awareness, people can follow me on Twitter at Rosemary100. It's a very extraordinary dialogue that goes on there with new information out there and people's reactions and we crowdsource information to know what's going on. So this is a way of creating that momentum to raise awareness and to push for a common sense policy and practice to be able to make some of our own medicines here in the United States. I'd also commend to them uh, presentdangerchina.org, Bill, where a number of videos that Rosemary has done with the Committee on the Present Danger of China and a lot of other very relevant information are available as well. As, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a board member of yours, it's outstanding information there, and I think it does, it does outline all of the uh, issues we face coming from China. Here's what I suggest. We, we, we've sort of used our time we have today. I'm looking at your testimony, and I'm looking at the whole list of recommendations. I suggest we come back with a pretty detailed list of things that people ought to be lobbying for because we've come at some pretty high level things but let's 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 nail this down into some actionable items for uh, people watching or listening because uh, this there's i don't think there's many more important issues right now that we address we get past the virus this this uh, this dependence on china and china's aggression is maybe the biggest problem america faces Amen. good plan I look forward to that Okay. In the meantime, a bill, a China RX is available on Kindle. We're trying to get actual books produced and online. That's coming. But in the meantime, it's available on Kindle. Share it with your member of Congress, with people who you think should know, and together we can uh, make a difference. Yeah, I, I would. I would just stress that again. The the reading through it on Kindle, which I did, uh, it's it's the best compendium of both where we are now where we ought to go, but also how we got here. And the stories, the human stories in this are, are, are vivid, and particularly the doctor that got overdosed with heparin, which was, which was manufactured with contaminants uh, from China. You read that story, you think about your, uh, the drugs you get completely differently. Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. we've got your, would you, uh, Rosemary, give us your Twitter again. Yes, it's at Rosemary 100. I hope you'll um, follow and sign on and contribute to the dialogue. Frank? And presentdangerchina.org. Okay. Well, thanks. We'll be back uh, with, our, with our detailed list. And thanks for joining us, watching, listening. We can be found on YouTube and all the major podcast, podcast platforms. And uh, we'll be back uh, with uh, this and other subjects that uh, matter right now uh, with the America crisis America's facing. So thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Want more? Be sure to subscribe at thebillwaltonshow.com or on iTunes.